Hello, everybody. Welcome to Therapy Dog Talk. My name is Sherry. My pup's names are Sunny and Riley, and each week we talk with different therapy dog teams around the world about the impact that they're making in their area. If you're just getting started or you're not sure where to get started, we have a free guide for you that you can find at freeguide.therapydogtalk.com. And we also have a free community. You can join at community.therapydogtalk.com. Today, I'm really excited. We're going to be talking to Jennifer and Eclipse, who I actually met through the guide. So when you receive it and I say, hey, you reach out. I want to know what you're doing. I really do mean it. We had a great conversation and I'm looking forward to sharing that with you all today. Oh, I figured it out. Yay. I love it. Eclipse is here as well. She's just hiding right here. That's okay. It's really hard to fit everyone in the window unless you sit on the floor, which is what I used to do for every episode. <laughs> you want to sit up? No. She's like, it's it's still my morning. It's still nap time, mom. <laughs> it's okay. Let her do her thing. It's yeah. totally fine. Well, Jen, for those who don't know you in Eclipse, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. My name is Jennifer Ullman. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm a marriage and family therapist in Southern California, Orange County area. Me in Eclipse. Oh, there she is. We've been working together for quite a few years now. She was originally training to be a service dog and I was her service dog trainer. Okay. She was medically retired before placement as she has some outdoor allergies that make it just not fair for her to be in a full service role. Sure. Yeah. The organization was like, but you're a therapist and we still want her to be in service because she is so empathetic and amazing with other people. Then we kind of adjusted and started working with her in a therapeutic assistant kind of role. That's, That's great. Kind of our story in a nutshell. I love it. And then how long? Six years old Burmese mountain dog okay. uh, mixed with a standard poodle. Okay. So Bernie Doodle. Yeah. We have a couple of those neighbors they're fun pups very happy pups <laughs> i love that how long had you been training her for a service animal before they were like you can just keep her so i was placed with her when she was i want to say like eight months old for service dog training and i had her for almost two years before they made an official switch okay she got kennel cough and was going through some puppy allergy issues so when we were doing that she wasn't in service dog mode she was just in puppy mode because that's again not fair to the dogs when they're sick to make mm -hmm. them work so once we got through all that and they did that, that kind of assessment of like she has all her basic training skills and meets all those requirements but just like her medical and anxiety related issues they're like she would do better in a more one-on-one -on -one, not I have to be in a certain role setting. So probably about like two years into that. And then I've had her for six years. Okay. All right. How did your training with her pivot when you went from service dog training to therapy dog training? So when we were doing service dog training, in my role, we do basic command work. So teaching them the touch, the nose it, the how to go through, sitting, staying, waiting and the socializing work. And then they kind of graduate around like one and a half, two in our program to do the more specific. So like if they're going to be more blind assistants, PTSD assistant, and they kind of do more catering, we call it graduating to college kind of idea. So for us, it became more about she since she was socialized and she had all the basic commands, getting her used to the more one-on-one -on -one setting with people, bringing her into the office without clients at first to kind of see how she was vibing in the office and then kind of working specifically with her with just like one client at a time where we had that pre-consensual conversation with the client ahead of time of, hey, this is an opportunity I can provide. I'm not sure how it's going to work quite yet. She's still training to do this work and kind of noticing where Eclipse was fitting in better with clients and what she was kind of naturally doing and working towards mm -hmm. our strengths as a team and helping her feel confident in a therapeutic setting. And she fell into it right away. She was like, oh, I get to come here and get loved on and get scratches and get more treats. Mom, I'm in. <laughs> she just has such a natural way. She's so calm and she'll just kind of lay on the floor on their feet and do a lot of grounding work and is more an anchor that way. And then noticing that the training that we had done specifically with socializing in the service dog world 
She had worked a lot with kids already. She came to grad school with me. So we also joke that she's a perfectly good therapist because she graduated a master's program for therapy. She was there on graduation day. She went through the program. But because of the socializing we had already done and her natural fit and her vibes as a, her own little personal self, it kind of blended in very smoothly. Were there any surprises for you along that journey? Absolutely. I think sometimes how she naturally reacts, I joke that you can't train dogs to do certain things, but it's not really a joke. So often in the service dog world and then as a therapy dog or therapy assistant in a marriage and family therapy setting, the dog is their own unique self. And even my previous history training service dogs, you can tell where their fit is going to be. The first dog I trained, originally they were thinking like blind assist and they're like, oh, we love this dog. We're not going to train the personality out of him. He's not a blind assist dog, but he went on to become an amazing PTSD medical assistant service dog. With her, the surprising aspects when she's working with a client is what she innately does with them at times, working with clients in trauma or who are more emotionally dysregulated in the moment and how she'll so naturally because I never force her to go to a client she can sit in the room where she wants to sit she can kind of interact as she sees fit because I don't want to stress her out by any means and be like oh no you have to go over there but she'll just kind of lay naturally at their feet or like licking their hands or kind of touching them with the paw of like hey it's okay One time I had a client who was just really talking down on themselves and she not roughly, but pawed them of like, hey, don't talk to my friend that way. I can't train that. That's amazing. And just the surprisings also interacting outside of the therapy office when we bring her to other places, how she sometimes just knows the person who needs a little extra love. Or the person who just needs that little grounding on their feet. It shouldn't be as surprising anymore after six years, but it always surprises me. (laughs) I love that. That's very cool. Do you volunteer with her as well? Yeah. So I have volunteered her in settings that I've already kind of known. She doesn't have the full training as a therapy dog to go into medical settings. Okay. But I've gotten permission as the therapeutic assistant dog to bring her into my family's church settings and my mom works at a preschool and we've brought her into those (laughs) settings to teach the kids about service animals and animals with vests Mm -hmm. and I have brought her in to those worlds and that's all because she grew up as a service dog training in those worlds as well so they were already kind of used to her (laughs) did you end up registering or certifying her through any therapy organization No, and that's why we don't do the medical world yet. As a therapy dog, she is primarily a therapeutic assistant. Okay. Is that something that you plan to do or it just works well for you the way you're doing it now? Right. It works well. There's that inkling of like, yeah, I want to get this fully into the therapeutic dog world and be able to bring her to more places because she is such a natural kind of fit into the world. And since she has a lot of the service dog training as well we're like already halfway yeah yeah it'd probably be a breeze for her to pass the test for sure what do you do then if you don't have that that coverage through those organizations what do you do for like risk mitigation or whatnot with your clients so one i never bring the dog in without the clients knowing Mm -hmm. there is like full conversations ahead of time and then it's in all of my informed consents And it's in all of my like pre, like I put it on the website. She's in the process of getting all this done. We're doing more trainings. Also, right now I'm in a group practice setting. My boss knows. There is all the consent down the line. Even our landlord in the office is fully aware. We have on record my pet insurance, her training background as a service dog, as a retired service dog and placed in that service dog organization as my therapeutic assistant dog. So that's kind of how we've mitigated that in the process of as we get slowly more trained. (laughs) There was that need to get me licensed first, and then we're going to get her licensed. I understand that. I'm doing both at the same time over here. It's a lot. (laughs) It's a lot. I just rushed in my application for the law and ethics exam because I didn't realize it's a four to six week 
application process to take the test that you then have to take before you can renew your associates. Yeah. But I'll jokingly say we graduated our program in 2019 from our marriage and family therapy program and I'm dual licensed LMFT and LPCC. Okay. So it was like the two law and ethics, the two clinical exams, the 3000 hours for both. So it's a lot. And I did not start using her in that setting until I was licensed. Yeah. So I wasn't really bringing her in. I worked occasionally with one client as an associate, but I was like, she is not going to be fully until it's my license. Yeah. When we had Dr. Taylor Chastain Griffin on, she was talking about, she's the executive director for AAA IP. Mm-hmm. And she was talking about how the best advice she received who it was from. It was from someone very well known in this space. I forget who. But it was to make sure that you really know your trade before introducing yes. the animal. So make yes. sure if you're going to bring your animal into therapy work, that you really know what you're doing as a therapist before right. you add in an animal too. Absolutely. And I felt like with her specifically, because we'd been doing all of the service dog training together because I was her handler at the time. Yeah. And I was doing my therapy work separate. Like she didn't come to the office with me during my training shifts, even though she came to school with me. Mm -hmm. She didn't come through a majority. I want to say maybe the last hundred hours of my associateship, she was showing up a little bit more. But during that, I was well versed in what I know and my clients at the time. Yeah. Uh, And then started introducing her as I was reading more and figuring out how to best introduce her into that setting. And then during COVID and being all telehealth, right? it almost became really easy to integrate her because I'm like, hey, here's the dog on Zoom. She's going to be in the background anyway. And then Mm -hmm. using a lot more metaphoric work with Mm -hmm. her, especially with my kid clients of like, well, you know, Eclipse is dealing with this problem right Mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. How would you help Eclipse handle that? Right. Eclipse is really afraid to go to the doctor's office. What could you tell Eclipse to help her? Yeah. So even yeah. if she's not in the room using her as like that externalization of a fear mm-hmm. or that externalization of a behavioral problem of like, okay, well, Eclipse is going to let you know how she did next week, but she wants to hear from you how you did next week. Yeah. And then yeah. she would pop up in my lap because she's a bigger girl. She can stand and be completely on camera at my mm-hmm. desk and I would do her voice behind her and she would talk to the clients, to the kiddos. Yeah. So yeah. I love that. Yeah, Sunny was present for all of my grad school courses and traineeship hours and now my associate hours because I started during the pandemic. <laughs> so there is a lot you can do to implement them even virtually. Right. Uh, I know you mentioned there were things that you found while you were reading. What were some of those resources that you found to be really helpful? Well, there's this amazing resource online called Therapy Dog. <laughs> that was one of the big ones. Then during my grad school program, when you have access, the privilege of the databases for research and reading all the scientific studies and the peer-reviewed research on animal-assisted therapies and the therapy dog world, that was just helpful understanding kind of like the science and nuance behind it. I'm a huge nerd. I love the science behind things. And then through the service dog organization, that I was a part of, just a lot of their literature that they provided as well helped on that foundational level. And I've kind of just like scaffolded from there, like, oh, well, this is a cool resource or like, oh, this is kind of what's going on. But yeah. I definitely yeah. used you a lot. <laughs> 10 out of 10 would recommend. Yeah. Well, I wasn't seeking out compliments, yeah. but thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know when I was getting ready to graduate, I downloaded like everything I could find in our databases on animal assisted interventions because I didn't know when I would lose access. Right. No, like I don't really care if I can read it all right now. The to be read file on our computers. Exactly. And it's interesting. There is so much crossover, I think, between service dog work and therapy animal work. Even though their jobs are different, a lot of their skills are the same. Right. Yeah. Even just the foundational <laughs> training that she has has really helped even the gentleness of her she doesn't high five she touches so when she touches it's a very gentle touch yeah because it's all coming from a place of a service need of alerting to an issue so like it knows it and that's even more gentle 
way of her engaging with someone and that's touching their nose to whatever the item or the person is. She knows how to hug. (laughs) That's one of her commands. But then even just some of the grounding work that she was trained because the organization I was through does a lot of mental health service dog placement and PTSD service dog placement. So a lot of it is helping them kind of know the foundations of laying on the feet or placing for boundary work. Let's get them to train to go behind someone to do alert from the back or alert from the front. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that helps. And kind of understanding from that mental health perspective, going into service dog training and transitioning her into a therapeutic assistant. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. And then when it came time to, I feel like so many people when they're trying to implement animal assisted therapy, they're like, where do I find the interventions? How did you figure out what would be helpful for her to do with your clients? So I started working with adults with her first because... I felt like one consent wise, it was more of a one on one consensual. Hey, I'm going to bring a dog. Are you comfortable with this? And at first, it was just a an opportunity for them to have like a gentle touch presence in the room of just like one is she comfortable. So we did the meet and greet out at the end of a session before he like I arranged her to get dropped off in a consensual way where I went and got her from the car, Mm -hmm. brought her back to the client. We met ahead of time. The first meeting was not like, hey, so now we're going to sit together for an hour. And like, okay, it is Eclipse feeling comfortable with this person Mm -hmm. as we started to introduce her. And it was an instant click. It was amazing (laughs) to see. So at first, it definitely became just a gentle presence in the room and giving an opportunity for this client who does have a trauma background to have a gentle touch dynamic Mm -hmm. and for her and eclipse they were just kind of working on reading each other's boundaries in a way Mm -hmm. dogs are amazing at communicating boundaries yeah and we'll we'll let you know probably sometimes more direct than humans do of what they are comfortable with and what they are not Mm -hmm. and kind of letting the client also communicate that in a way as well. And this client said that they had worked previously with therapy dogs. So I knew that they mm-hmm. kind of knew what they were up and doing. But yeah. Uh, so one of the interventions has sometimes more naturally been like Eclipse will just go lay on their foot and just provide a pace to pet while they talk and externalizing the emotions so that they don't have to talk to me directly. They're mm-hmm. talking through Eclipse to me. Yeah. Like, it kind of breaks down that barrier of like, this is kind of scary to say, so I'm going to say it to the dog and it's not as real versus when I say it to my therapist. Yeah. And then from there, we've worked on having the client start learning some of Eclipse's commands so that they start to feel more confident and feeling like their voice is being heard and being seen and being respected through the dog and a lot of that touch work again. To the point now where like Eclipse will just be like, hey, I'm just going to like literally lean up right against you and help ground you in this moment. So there's a lot of grounding again, a lot of boundaries work, and then a lot of metaphor work with her. We have this whole concept of you have to find your paws, four of them. (laughs) So we talk about like the dog's four basic needs, food, walk, comfort, and support, and outside playtime. Okay. (laughs) Well, we need those, take our paws, find them. We know those things too. Yeah. So like Eclipse, and I do Eclipse's voice. It's real corny. She teaches them the paws. It's a mindful mix exercise. They go out and find their paws in real life. Do we get to hear Eclipse's voice? Yes. So it's, I like to teach my clients about their paws because I have paws and there's four of them, right? So that's Eclipse's voice. I love it. And the dog has a voice, right? That's how that works. They do. So then transitioning into working with kiddos, a lot of it has also been their self-esteem and comfort work through communicating with Mm -hmm. Eclipse, Mm -hmm. that petting, that grounding, and then working on, I have clients that do have trauma backgrounds and teaching them that like, you know, Eclipse, sometimes when she brushes her hair, she gets real rough and she kind of pulls it. And can you teach Eclipse how to brush her hair? And then that's something that they need to work on. Mm, yeah. 
model. So finding them ways to promote autonomy and self-independence and autonomy over their bodies through the dog. Yeah, I love that. Molly had a question here, moving service dog to therapy dog, how do you make the transition? I know we talked about this a little bit, but was there anything that stood out to you that you needed to adjust from service dog training to therapy dog training? Yes. So in service dog training, there's moments of socializing. Mm -hmm. And then there is this dog is my service dog. Mm -hmm. You are not engaging with her right now. She is on the clock. She is working. So, uh, you know, when we were training her to socialize as a service dog, it was more like we are training for a specific need. So if this dog was going to get placed in a setting where there might be a diagnosis of autism or neurodivergency, I would have one of the kiddos that I was working with outside of the therapeutic room. So this was like maybe like in a preschool setting, in a Sunday school setting, in my friend's house that has kids like, hey, we are going to like in her safety as well. So it was like, oh, I can sense she's uncomfortable. I'm not going to make my dog do this right now. But if she was vibing and having fun, we're going to toss all of her ears gently to kind of get her used to her ears being touched. <laughs> or we're going to mess with her tail gently to get her used to her tail getting touched because there could be a future for her where that will happen regularly. Right. And we don't want it to become a negative interaction. But that was kind of socializing. Mm-hmm. And then there was service dogs training of, no, she's working right now. We don't want her to get distracted. She needs to stay at my feet. She needs to do this. When I took her to school, most of the professors loved her. So there was the rule that before class, you can engage with Eclipse. Once class starts, she is working. We cannot distract her. We take a break. You can get some cuddle time. At the end of class, we'll get her off the clock. She can be a dog again. Right. But again, with therapy dog transition, it's my responsibility to make sure she is feeling comfortable as a therapeutic assistant in my office and that she's never being pressured or put into a position where she's anxious. Mm-hmm. And because I've had that long history with her, I know her well enough now to be like, oh, you're uncomfortable. Yeah. Hey, how about you come sit by me? Or getting her used to not having to sit by me. Because mm-hmm. if service dog, it was always sit by me. It's okay to go sit by the client. It's okay to go and just focus your attention there and not worry about me for a change. But that transition was interesting to get her used to. Yeah. How does she let you know when she's uncomfortable or she needs a break? In my office setting right now, we have a giant table (laughs) that has a little table underneath it. I call it her little cubby hole. So she goes and hangs out in her little cubby and is kind of more like, I'm just going to chill over here. Kind of done. (laughs) I think also because of Growing up in a school setting and growing up in, for her, in a therapy setting, she understands the 50 minute hour really well. She okay. knows the cues. Like in school, she knew when a professor said, Well, okay, next class, she'd be like, Hey, I'm done. I'm out. And now she knows my verbal cues yeah. of like, Okay, so as we start to wrap up right. for this week, and she'll shoot me a look. She has the most expressive eyes of mom. I need to take my vest off. I have some zoomies. I need some pets. So I, as a therapist, have to be really mindful of my time as well of like, not only do I need that 10 minutes between clients, sometimes she needs it more. And she needs a time to just wiggle it out just as much as I do sometimes. Yeah. Like we once had a very emotionally reactive client and she was under that table. So I stood in front of her and I was like, you don't have to go past me right now. And afterwards I got on the floor with her. I took off her vest. I was like, you're a good girl. You handled that so well. Get all the treats. Like Aww. you're done for the day. Aww. There's also times where I'm like, oh, she's been to the vet this week. There was a lightning storm. Mm-hmm. It's really windy. She does not have to go to work that yeah. day. She is not a huge fan of the wind and we have a second floor office. It is real windy. That's not fair. Yeah. She cannot communicate that discomfort with words. It's my job to know that discomfort and you get to stay home with your grandma and you do not have to go to work that day. Yeah, that's so important. When they're stressed by good spell, they can't hear the clients on top of the other stress. Like we can communicate with clients. I'm having a bad day. I am so sorry if I'm not 100% here or I'll cancel a client and be mm-hmm. like, hey, I cannot give you 100%. It is fair as a therapist to not give you that right now. No. I'm taking the day off. They don't have that cell phone. So I'm like, okay, let's read the room. She's done. <laughs> yeah. 
And sometimes we have to recognize that for them because they just love what they do so much. So they're like, no, I'm ready to go. And it's like, no, Brad, you need a break. Right. right. And in all honesty, sometimes I need a break. I'm like, I've been with this dog all week, all weekend. She's been at my side. Mom just needs to be a therapist right now and not have to take care of you as top of it. You're staying home. And she'll be like, but I want to go. I swear you see it in their eyes, but I want to go to work. Why are you abandoning me? Yeah. She does love it when we say, hey, do you want to go to work? She is right there, ready by her best to get dressed. Yeah. It takes a lot out of you to balance your client's needs and your animal's needs on top of your own needs don't just disappear. They're there too. (laughs) So like, I'm very mindful of for some reason, I decided to give myself a bad day and have like eight clients back to back. That's not fair to her. Yeah, you're like, it's bad enough that I did it to myself. I'm not doing it hurts. I'm very mindful to look ahead at my schedule and be like, does she have an honest dinner break, bathroom break? Does she have a bathroom break in the middle of the day? Because yeah. I can run down to our bathroom. She has to go outside down to the lawn. And sniff of it first. Yes. And that's not fair for her if I'm like, okay, but we have a client in five minutes. Hurry up. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for sharing your story with yes. Eclipse. Is there anything else that you wanted to share while you're here? Something that I'm really huge in advocating on is just kind of understanding all the differences, which I know you talk about all the time of like service, emotional support, therapy dog, therapeutic assistant in a therapy setting. And it's something I talk to my clients a lot about, too, because they're like, oh, therapy dog, you can write like a therapy letter. And I'm like, no, no, (laughs) that is something totally different. And just kind of advocating for the education of it too especially coming from the service dog world and coming from a strong understanding of like ada laws Mm -hmm. there's such a big difference and kind of just spreading that education and that awareness and also that if it's a dog if it's your cat if it's any kind of animal that's used in a service or therapeutic setting just how incredible that is and how important that work is so like if you're a part of it or you're an advocate for it of just like yay continue doing the work and understanding your animals needs and the legal differences and making sure everything's covered but i think it's such a joy to see a client's face light up in a different way or them click something or there's an interaction with them and the dog that i can't provide that just provides such a grounding healing moment it's so beautiful so yeah thank you for all the work you do as well (laughs) It's totally my pleasure. I love doing it. It's a great way for me to be able to talk with teams like you every single week. So I enjoy doing that. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much. Is there anywhere that people can keep in touch and follow your journey with Eclipse? Yeah. So, I mean, this is my personal account, which I have no problem people following. You'll see more of her like everyday life adventures with me. I'm a huge nerd. So aside from doing animal assisted therapy in the therapeutic setting, I'm also a geek and nerd therapist. So I use a lot of pop culture interventions. So I have a podcast called Stories with Shrinks, where I'll reference Eclipse sometimes in there as well, because I'll talk about the integration of like animal assisted therapy with pop culture Um, clients. And then I'm Jen Ullman Therapy online. You can find me, you can find my website and my Psychology Today profile there as well. So... Those are kind of the world that I live in. I will definitely have to check out your podcast because geek therapy is another interest of mine. So we'll we'll talk. Don't worry. We'll we'll talk for sure. Yeah. And actually, we live very close to each other. So we should talk in person. (laughs) Have a puppy play date. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much. It was really great talking with you. You as well. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.